Welcome everyone uh, to The Matrix, Conversations and Transformations. This is a seminar series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice at Occidental College. I'm Professor Malik Moazam Dolat, and I'm joined by one of the co-organizers of the series and the chair of the CTSJ department, Professor Heldman. And before we get started, let me just tell you a little bit about this series if it's your first time uh, clicking and watching. The series focuses on pressing current events and seeks to connect our community with experts, scholars, artists, and the most effective activists. Uh, so the way we normally do this is uh, we run this in a webinar format if you're here live. Uh, so this is just for the live audience. Um, there's a Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your screen. You can submit a question at any time and we'll come around to it. Very briefly, um, you can find CTSJ uh, on Twitter and on Instagram at CTSJ Oxy, O X Y. And you can find, um, if you didn't find us through our YouTube channel or on one of the podcast platforms, you can find us and future events and past events at oxy.edu slash matrix. And with that, let me turn it over to the chair of the department, Professor Caroline Heltman. Hello and welcome to our second to last matrix for this semester. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Lizette Garcia with us today. She holds a uh, PhD in experimental psychology from Tufts University with an expertise in the impact of culture and identity on individual decision-making. Dr. Dr. Lizette Garcia has taught at Harvard and Columbia, and she later held a postdoc and was a professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She is the founder of the World Migration Fund that is dedicated to restoring dignity to the immigrant and migrant experience through education, advocacy, and legal support services. Um, Dr. Garcia has worked as a trial consultant and an expert witness and is a certified family and divorce mediator. She's trained in compassionate communication, conflict resolution, peacekeeping circles, and hostage negotiations. The breadth of her experience has given her the keen ability to work with victims of crime, trauma, immigration, and survivors of uh, attempted suicide. As a native of El Paso, Texas, and the daughter of Mexican immigrants, her experience as a Mexican-American woman and human rights advocate has taken her to many different worlds. Um, she's a civil rights activist who's worked directly with Maya Angelou and Coretta Scott King. Uh, she uh, has worked with child soldiers in Liberia. She's worked as a prisoner's advocate in India and as a scholar of uh, Buddhist uh, texts with over 20 years of practice and four years of silent meditation retreat, all of which we will be asking her about. Um, <laughs> Dr. Garcia is also a voting member of the Latin Grammys for her contributions on musical projects in Peru, uh, Brazil, and the United States most notably for her production work with the indigenous Shipibo tribe in the Peruvian Amazon and playing various percussion instruments on world music albums by the great Barrett Martin, uh, Joy Harjo and Nando Rees. Um, Lisette's first book is uh, out November of 2020 and it is mm. titled Ponderosa Conversations with Extraordinary Ordinary Women. So with no further ado, let me introduce this extraordinary, I don't know ordinary, but extraordinary woman, <laughs> Dr. Garcia, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, definitely ordinary, definitely. And here's my book, it's called, yeah, it's Poderosas, which means um, mighty women, extraordinary ordinary. Um, I've gotten some pushback on the extraordinary ordinary bib, but I think we are all extraordinary ordinary. and. Um, um, so yeah, so here's the book. Really Talk to us a little bit. Here. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing with us and our community. Um, tell us about that pushback. What is the, what's the controversy here? And well, I mean, it wasn't really much. It was just, you know, saying, well, why does, why the ordinary, you know, why just not leave it at extraordinary. And I think it's because the average person thinks has this mental image of what extraordinary means and maybe we think that that person is famous and world known and the ordinary part really harkens to like maybe nobody knows who we are maybe no one knows what we've done maybe they pass us on the streets and don't know what an amazing story actually each of us holds right so that's what um 
that's what I mean by ordinary. Well, talk to us about some of these uh, extraordinary, ordinary women. Uh, who, who do you feature in your book and how did you choose them? What makes them extraordinary, these ordinary yeah, women? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I credit my husband, Barrett Martin. Um, it, it is actually his brainchild, uh, the project was, because what he would really wanted to do was to honor all the spiritual teachers that he'd come across. And it just so happened that most of them were women. And so he had kind of been like throwing around this idea and it just grew from there. So I'm, I, I kind of uh, hijacked it, <laughs> if you will, and um, added, added some of my favorite people to it as well. And so it really, um, it became this project of traveling around the world and having conversations with these women in their, you know, in their world, wherever that was, whether it was in a, you know, a Maloka, a healing, a healing uh, ceremony house in the Peruvian Amazon, or a pickup truck with an artist uh, running across New Mexico. Um, it was, it, I think it kind of brought out the genuineness of each woman. And, um, and that was really our hope, you know, I think something important to say about the book is that we did keep it in question answer format. And the reason we did that is because I really wanted to keep true to their voice. You know, I, I'm sure we shaped it a little through our editing and such, but I'm transcribing, but um, they had the final say, you know, and they, we had to get their final okay before we went forward. That was really important to us. And, um, so the book itself, it's broken up into three parts, the healers, the teachers, and the artists. And um, as I said in my section of the book, I, you know, I said, it, actually, these women could probably fall into all three of these categories, these archetypes, if you will. And, um, you know, but, but it, this is what they were for us. We put them in the categories of what they were for us. And, um, and we just asked questions as if we were just sitting around the table. And really what I wanted to do is bring people to the table. I wanted them to feel like they were sitting there listening to a conversation. And um, that was really important to me because you mentioned that I'd worked with Coretta Scott King and Maya Angelou and really I didn't work with them. Really, I just sat at a table and I listened, you know, and I listened to the stories and I listened to their ideas. And um, really I sat in a corner taking notes furiously, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, one time my Angela turned around and she's like, and what do you think little brown sister? You know, and it was just like, it was like the highlight of my life, you know, to just, I don't even remember what she was asking, but it was important. And that's, and I wanted to bring people into that circle, if you will. So, you know, we have Angie Chavez, who's a, a doctor, a pediatric doctor, um, who in El Paso, uh, needing help herself, couldn't find it. So she came back and she filled a gap. We had Carolyn Hartness, a Native uh, American woman who, who's amazing, who does fetal alcohol work. We have uh, Magdalena Nidith from the Peruvian Amazon sharing uh, their visions of the world and how to create harmony with it and how it's necessary and how it's necessary for our health really as humans we don't see that connection in this modern world the way they do um, teachers we have dr robin root who did incredible work across you know really the world africa asia um, she real advocate for women you know just one of those women who will who's not afraid to fight. And that aspect of her made her very capable in uh, fighting for women's rights. Uh, Maria Heldman, you know, professor in Alaska who believes in the power of teaching and the next generation and will stop at nothing to make sure that they get the best um, possible education uh, to serve the world better.
uh, Yuka Koenig, a Zen master, um, you know, who, who is teaching us we're not separate even from each other. <laughs> and um, then down to the artists where we talk to our mothers. Uh, we talk to Miriam Parker, an incredible dancer who offers a magical world of view and Erin Courier, who actually did, she did the, the, the art here on the front of the book, which is just beautiful. And Erin is a woman who walks the walk. She's a real advocate and she honors the people that no one even turns to look at. You know, the shoeshine person, the person who cleans our bathrooms. Um, it's an incredible group of women. Mm. And, and what is the thread that binds it all together? Ah. That they're powerful, that they all figured out how to step into their power. And they did so without hesitation because they saw the need in the world for it. Quietly, mm. right? Quietly in their communities, in their world, their immediate world. Well, and you have done much of this as well, right? So it's interesting how you're telling the stories of others, but this is your story, your story of going to different parts of the world and engaging in, in community activism. Um, and I know that Professor Malik has some questions about that. I think you're on mute. Yes, I got to unmute myself there. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the introductions, um, we mentioned that you had done um, work with former child combatants in Liberia. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, about that, and then we can get into that in some depth. Um, you know, I worked right after grad school, or shall I say my last year of grad school, I took a leadership course with Dr. Badi Foster um, and others. And he became a mentor, a really strong mentor of mine in, in that time. And then he got hired as the president of the nonprofit found, um, not for profit called the Phelps Stokes Fund. And he asked me to join him. So my, my goal had always been like, just go, go be a professor. And, and that was my track. And then all of a sudden someone who, who really meant a lot to me was inviting me to come along on this adventure, you know, for, for, really for civil rights. And um, so I took it and I, I had to <laughs> work through grad school, finish my dissertation, especially fast to be able to join him in time. And one of the projects we did was with former combatants from Liberia. Um, they, you know, they had just, they had just come out of civil war a few years before. Um, and they, I, I mean, I don't know how much people know, but children, uh, they addict children to different drugs so that they can be easily controlled so that they can fight against each other, really. And um, it's a terrible, terrible uh, tragedy. And um, so we, our goal was to go in and give these children not only tools to move forward in the future, but um, help them heal from the trauma that they had experienced, maybe even um, you know, help them with the addiction. So there were various aspects to the project. I was not the head of the project, but um, being second to uh, the president, um, I, I worked on you know, a little bit on all the various projects we had. What were the numbers uh, of people you were working with? Do you, do you have a sense of the scope there? Oh, wow. Um, thousands, hundreds? You know, yeah, that I mean, things. there were there were certainly thousands that were available and in the particular area, but probably only reaching hundreds. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what were the, the main issues they were facing? Was it that kind of clinical work where you're working through particular issues? What were the main kinds of issues? And then I have one little minor question. I've always been fascinated by yeah. um, differences in um, what categories of mental health issues uh, and cultural difference around those things. You know, I'm wondering if you, you sort of ran into some of that while you were talking to them. 
Well, being a psychologist, I certainly uh, saw the need for that. And unfortunately, that was not the focus of, of this particular project. And because I wasn't head of the project, I couldn't steer it necessarily the ways I would have. If I could have, I would have definitely, I could have told them or I would have said to them, you can't give people tools without addressing the basic found. The, you know, the, the basic core of what's at issue here, which is our mental health and the mental health of these children that have suffered so much trauma. You can give them a tool, but they won't be able to use it. And I, you know, um, like I said, it, it wasn't, I wasn't the head of the project, but um, I think that is in part why they went right back into civil war, not long after. You know, because I think the mental health, I think there were people there trying to work on the mental health aspect. It would have been a huge project. The UN, I know, had a, a lot of health workers on the ground, um, but it's, a, it's huge. It's a huge problem, you know, yeah. even still. You see it across the world in Colombia. You see it everywhere, you know, where, where there's been civil wars. Yeah. And tell us, to follow up on that, tell us about your work in the Indian prison system and how you made that transition and what your interventions were there. Yeah, again, you know, it's, um, I've had the great honor of working in these various places and I was never the head of the project and um, maybe it was good. But so I was already at John Jay and I was already kind of transitioning into um, I'm thinking about my long-term retreat. And so working in areas that meant something to me became very important. Um, I became interested in, in meditation as a, as a tool for healing, you know, healing trauma, healing, um, just healing in general. And um, I reached out to Karen Betty, who, um, gosh, Karen Betty was the first inspector, first woman, to ever be have and hold any kind of high position in India. And she in 1993 became the inspector general in the Delhi prisons. Now imagine because she's the first woman in a culture that doesn't necessarily um, expect or even want women in those positions. Um, she had a lot of, of, of uh, work, you know, she, she was up against the system, really. And so they gave her the worst prison thinking she would fail. And she didn't, you know, she brought in Vipassana meditation and Vipassana retreats, and transformed that prison, the, it was the worst prison in the world. She, they lowered re recidivism, they lowered uh, visits to the doctor, they lowered um, amount of waste, it was incredible, the changes. And my goal was not necessarily to go in and, and do anything. She had done it already. Um, I wanted to know, how can I quantify in dollars what you have done so that I could come back to the US and we can start something like this in our prisons, um, really start addressing this our, our prison problem. And... Um, so that's what I did. I really like sunk into her numbers. What, 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 how much were you saving on, on <laughs> waste? How much were you saving on medical visits? Um, and she had just started a program. So what happened was the prisoners really began to improve their conduct. Riots re were reduced. Their conduct was improved. Their health was improved by, by the meditation. Um, and so eventually the guards wanted to participate too. And that's where she was in the project when I came in. Um, you know, so I thought that's really incredible, you know, because um, Americans are quite aware of like the Stanford prison experiment where the guards are, uh, they act in a particular way because they're expected to given the position just by definition. And um, here she had completely flipped just that concept of, of the prison guard. And, um, and so, you know, this was back, this was back early 2000s or, or you know, 2006, five, six. And um, I came back to the US with my, you know, my report and I went to one of the worst prisons in the US and uh, I presented my, my, the work I had done. 
and the numbers I had found and collected. And I really wanted to make a, a you know, a case uh, for why they ought to bring meditation into the prisons in a very systematic way. And, and I didn't get anywhere with it. And I didn't really have much time to really spend on it because I went into three-year retreat myself um, just a few months later. But um, I came, I was happy to come out of retreat and a lot of prisons have indeed um, begun to let meditation in, meditation teachers come in. I don't know if anyone's doing systematic retreats the way she did, um, uh, but there's, there's been a change and, and I'm just happy about that. <laughs> so you were saying that you, you came back with, from, um, from India um, and you went into then uh, retreat, you said. Um, so this has to do with um, your work in Buddhist meditation. Is this what this was? Correct. Talk about that and what, it, what it's meant for you and how it's functioned for you. The retreat, having gone into retreat? The retreat, yeah. And yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was a really radical decision, right? Because I had spent my life getting educated and, and trying to get the perfect um, position. And, uh, you know, I had a huge NSF grant with one, a very popular professor, he and I, um, together. And um, I gave it all up to go into a three-year retreat. And I have to say to this day, it's one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, and I don't know, it's a decision many people can make. You know, I think more people have climbed Everest than have done three-year retreat. I climbed the Everest of the mind. And um, hopefully it's made me kinder. Hopefully it's made me... Um, more aware of people's needs, more capable of meeting those needs. Um, uh, it's taught me about the truth of the world. If there's hate in my heart and in my mind, I will continue to see it. So when I see it out in the world, I get on my meditation cushion and I, and I search for all the various places it could be hidden. You know, and when you have a three-year retreat, you, you can explore every aspect of the mind and, and you realize that it's real power. So what was the nature of the retreat? Was it a, a three years of silent? It retreat? was three years silent meditation, three, three years, three months, three days. Um, we were on a thousand acres of land. There was about 30 participants, but you really couldn't see each other because a thousand acres of land, you know, the, the, everything was pretty spread out. Um, I think some people, you know, may have needed more support. Um, I didn't. Uh, I was really, I mean, there was a period where I went almost, uh, gosh, almost two years without even seeing anyone else, you know. I'm sorry, and, I'm sorry. I have to interrupt oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think this, I don't want this to be glossed over. Yeah. What you're saying is you came back from India and then within weeks you went to a thousand acre piece of land and then for three years, uh, silent meditation and, and contemplation, that's what you said? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there was, it was India and then I went to China to do uh -huh. some work in China and then, yeah, and then retreat. So I've heard people talk about doing like one week or two weeks of silent meditation <laughs> and they have like essentially a breakdown. Yeah. Uh, they can barely keep it together. Yeah. Um, you did it for, you said you went two years without even really seeing anybody. Yeah. Right. Can you maybe talk us through, if you don't mind, I don't know to whatever extent you're willing to do it, the experience of like, you know, starting the silent meditation and the sort of what it, the phenomenological experience of going through that silence and when some yeah. markers happen where you see mm -hmm. some kind of change. Um, because you went over that, like, you know, it was like a nice three sentences. You're like, yeah, and it was quite, then I had some deep thoughts. Um, <laughs> But in my book, the intensity yeah. of that really has to be attended to, I think. So if you could tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Well, you know, I didn't go into three-year retreat without um, being prepared. I really prepared for seven years to go into retreat. I, I had done about a year total of retreat before I went into three-year retreat. So, but they were shorter, um, way shorter. <laughs> and... Um, uh, but I kind of, you know, when, when you start doing even short retreats, they're like, okay, you know, whatever issues you have, they're going to come up and they'll come up super strong and you better know what, 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 
you know, what's in your heart, who, who you're angry with, what, what, if, if depression is your thing, if, if, <laughs> I don't know, whatever, whatever is your thing, you got to know it really well. You got to know yourself really well before you even endeavor to begin a three-year retreat. So I thought I did, you know, I thought I had done a lot of work. I spent seven years uh, preparing a toolkit, if you will, for when I was in three-year retreat, um, what to pull out when, you know, what teaching, what meditation, what prayer to pull out, given any particular uh, obstacle that might come up. Um, so three-year retreat, yeah. Um, wow, it, there was, there's nothing like it. I, when you be, walk into a retreat, one of the first things you do is you set a boundary around the retreat area so you're protected, you know, so that obstacles don't come in, so that your concentration doesn't leave. And I remember when we set that final marker for retreat, it literally felt like we closed the door to this realm and stepped into another. I'd never experienced anything like it. And, and it, it just it just set the tone for the rest of the time, you know? Mm. And um, you have to know when to push. You have to know when to back off with your mind and meditation. If you push too hard, you can go crazy, you know, literally. And so it's this razor's edge of, 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 of push and release and relax and expand uh, and um, all the way through. You know, there's in, in Tibetan Buddhism, we have, a, it's like a science, you know, um, these, these pathway through meditation and the different markers you're supposed to meet as you go through. And I can say they were valid. You know, I, I certainly experienced the various levels, but it was a very, in a very female way, you know, it, these teachings, they're, they're 2,500 year old teachings from the Buddha. These sutras are, you know, meant for men, taught by men. And I really wanted to know, do they work for women? Is there a veracity to these teachings in this day and age? Do they work? <laughs> and, um, I think I found that they did, you know, a lot of the markers for me were emotional ones and they never talk about those uh, as they're written. Um, uh, but I, one of the beautiful things is as you're moving through, one of the first things you notice, cause you're, you're supposed to be completely silent, silent is how much you actually say things out loud. You, you stub your toe. What do you say? Ouch, you know, out loud. So all of a sudden you're, you're, you're trying to control that, that language, that prana that would leave um, by holding all that in. And I would say within the first, after the first month, I wasn't even speaking in my dreams. I would start speaking in my dreams and I would stop myself, you know, and, um, it, and it throws your mind and it opens your mind in a whole different way. What's the experience? So at some point, this is, it's, I mean, a month is about as long as I've ever heard anyone trying to do it. You know, I don't work in the circles you do, obviously. Um, but what happens to your relationship to language and the relationship between language and thought at that point? Like if you get a year in or nine months in, what's happening in your head? I mean, You're exactly just, right. Um, After yeah. about a year, a year is about that point when, when, what you're trying to do in that type of retreat is, is undo the mental concepts that you have been imprisoned in, right? Everything, all these beliefs we have, these, these um, limiting beliefs we have about ourselves, about the world, about others. You're really uh, about gravity, about everything you're trying. is like the Matrix, the movie, The Matrix, right? They're like, is that air you think you're breathing? You're really kind of challenging all of these things in this sort of retreat. Should really, that's where being an experimentalist was so helpful, right? I was an experimenter of each thought and belief that I held. And so after the first year, those concepts really begin to lose hold. 
And I'll tell you, it was hard to keep even anything screwed in. Like it manifests in like my glasses, the, the little the little thing keeping my glasses, that little screw kept coming out. Everything was just unscrewing, undoing because there was nothing holding those concepts. The conceptual world was falling apart for me. And so you have to be ready to let go of language. You have to, I, after about the first three months, I don't think I even looked at a book. I was starting to try to keep a journal and I realized it was counterproductive. So I wasn't reading, I wasn't, um, I wasn't writing. I was really, really focused on, on, on getting beyond, getting beyond every concept my mind believed so strongly in and challenging it. And, and when you do that, you realize it was never there the way you thought. And it does, it just begins to undo itself. Um, so learning to speak again, that was the hardest part, I would say. Uh, learning to speak again, learning to commute, you know, be around people again, um, uh, remembering words again, um, remembering names again. <laughs> it, took a, it took a while. Yeah. What was that transition like? Uh, how, how long did that take? How did you do that? Mm -hmm. And how are you a different person on the other end? I would say I felt somewhat like an alien for a good year. Um, <laughs> I, I could realize I just wasn't quite landing right with people, you know, and, and I, I really made a great effort to put people at ease. You know, it's kind of a scary thing. Um, people don't even like to ask you about you. They really don't even want to know um, about what happened or what that was. And, and you, it's, it's this kind of a scary thing for people. And I understood that. And I didn't want... I wanted to put people at ease, you know? And so when I came out of retreat, I, I had a lot of people I, I had taught over the years before. I just wanted to know where they were and I just wanted to know what they needed. And I just wanted to um, assure them that whatever experiences I had had were mine and that I wasn't gonna force anything on anyone else. Um, but if that if they needed some tools for life, I was always there to help if they wanted that. Um, you know, so I I within about five months after retreat, I end up back in New York City. That was not the plan. <laughs> but this wonderful woman, Sarah, she she's just like, come live with me. I went to for a visit, and she's like, you have to stay because I had lived in New York before, right? And so she has this penthouse and and access to the roof. So I lived on her roof for a few months and it was perfect because it was, it was like living in the sky. And I had this little um, monk's nest, you know, cause it was literally a utility room with a bed in it. And I was happy. <laughs> it felt like retreat. It felt like I could be in the middle of the city and still be um, totally alone. Mm. And, and available for, pe for people if they had questions, if they had concerns, if they needed help, if, with whatever they needed. And to follow up on that, so you, I don't wanna make assumptions about your family. I'm a first generation PhD. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you come, okay, you yeah, are. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so you choose this path and I don't know what it was like for you. For me, I didn't even know that path existed and then it opened up yeah. and then I went on that path. Yeah. So you went on this path that mm -hmm. your family had not been on before, you maybe didn't know about, and then you actually ended up choosing a different path, right? So obviously you're a PhD, you're an academic, but you, your life course is very different than a traditional academics. Can you talk about that path to academia and then that path away from academia? Oh, well, you're right. I mean, I came from a migrant family, a family of immigrants, and um, not to diminish who my, my family is and, and what they mean and their intellect even, but culturally, I was expected to just become a secretary and get married. You know, I mean, and that, that was how I was raised. And anytime, I remember being a little girl and just, it's, it's not very different from Carolyn Hartness in my book, you know, who says, 
you know, my father treated me like a little boy and it, it gave me this, this access to this world that maybe I wouldn't have had if I had been treated like a little girl. Uh, the same with me, you know, I think my dad really wanted a boy and um, I, if I wanted a car, I had to fix my car. If I wanted, you know, if something was wrong with the house, get up there and fix it. And, and so um, there was a part of me that was always like, I want to be a doctor. And they're like, well, don't aim too high. You know, <laughs> that takes a lot of money or whatever. Um, but I just did it. I just, even though the school, you know, counselors told me not to, even, even though everyone, the world was telling me not to, um, I knew there was something greater that I could do. So I went as far away from El Paso, Texas as I could. I went to Boston, <laughs> Massachusetts. Uh, I don't even, my mom didn't even know where that was on the map. You know, it was, it was just foreign, completely foreign. Um, uh, I didn't know anyone there. I get off the plane with my bags and I just start the quest, right? I, I, I meet professors and, I, and they're from different parts of the world and, and they're blowing my mind with what they're saying and I, I, I become voracious, right? And it started in high school. I, I started taking community college uh, classes in high school and there was a, a physics professor and a calculus professor and they were married. And they took me on like their daughter and I would, I, I just was voracious. And, and so it just went on through, it, it went on through my undergrad. Um, I was certain that I wanted to be a doctor. So I was pre-med for a long time. And I used to sit in the stacks of, of the medical libraries and read, read neuropsychology, like just case studies case study after case study, like, how does this brain work? How does the mind work? Why are people making the decisions they're making? Why are we who we are? I'm asking all these questions in my mind and I'm looking there and I'm like, they don't have the answers. The one answer I found was they don't know, you know, and it varies. You know, this person can have this accident and this part of the brain could be damaged, but whoa, wait, they have a different experience than this other one. And, and this healed or that didn't heal and this took over. And so that, that malleability, that pliability was really interesting to me, but I also saw the limits of it. So that's how I found my way to psychology. And um, it just was, the questions were closer to what I was asking in my head. And, um, and my, you know, I, I ended up having to go back to El Paso um, because my mom, uh, she just needed help at the time. And it was for me, I was like the biggest loser because I had to go back, right? Um, but it ended up being the most important decision I ever made in my life because there was this whole new crew of PhDs who was coming, they had all just come in and they were excited and they were doing research and, and I just found my way in there and I never looked back. Um, and that's how I made my way into academia um, and leaving it, leaving it, it was, a, a, it was a difficult, right? Because I, I had just worked towards it um, a good part of my life. And that, that was the vision I held for myself. And when I moved to New York, I started studying Buddhism, which also blew my mind and who, that I was also voracious for. And I just threw myself into those studies. But, but it was always like off to the side because I had this whole academic career. I had a lab full of students. I had teaching that I had to do and I, and I loved it. I loved it, you know? And, um, you know, political things happened and, um, and I just recognized that perhaps I wasn't gonna be recognized the way I wanted to be uh, right then and there in that time in that department. And I had this other option, three-year retreat. People were starting to talk about three-year retreat. And all of a sudden, just in one moment, I understood that that, that was my next challenge. Um, and, and just like that, it was like, okay, that's what I'm doing, you know, and I made the decision in my mind and, and, and the course, you know, the path just rolled out for me to do so. Yeah, so even though it was never in my mind, really, it, it was the perfect decision.
Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and what are you doing now? What are you working on now? Because you've had these, you know, you've maybe not reinvented yourself. You just are in a different space doing very similar yeah. work, right? What yeah. are you working on now? Well, I started the, um, well, actually, I first should say that my sister and I started a company um, helping immigrants, uh, the families stay together here in the, in the U.S. So it turns out that they need um, hardship evaluations just to prove that they need their loved one to stay. It's heartbreaking. And so a few years ago, we started this work and every day it's listening to story after story after story of the hardship, you know, of the hardship to, of losing someone or potentially losing someone, uh, the head of their household, the mother of their children, um, the parents. Um, and that led me to, to understand that there was a greater need. And so I founded the World Migration Fund, um, which is at its nascent stage. And something interesting happened. I, I was kind of in the mindset of just these immigrants and helping these immigrants as we know them here in the US. But as we began to roll this out and really think about it, the and the work that Barrett and I do and, and seeing for ourselves that these the permafrost is melting in the Arctic and trees are falling over and 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 we are in a climate crisis. So seeing it for ourselves and, and melding it with the, the stories I was hearing about immigration, I was like, oh my goodness, this, this is what we're all gonna be. This is our future, not just in this country, in every country. Climate crisis is gonna force migration. Migration, no country, no political border is prepared for it. And if we don't start talking about it now, we don't start talking about how we're gonna receive them, how we're gonna treat them, they're gonna end up in cages just like these little children and their parents are right now. And that's not okay. That, 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 that it's just no, nowhere in the world is that okay. So that's what I've taken on now <laughs> is really bring a board of people together who are ready to create an organization to address this around the globe. <laughs> I, it's just, your story is so moving, your personal story and your work in the world. Um, I'll ask one more question, but I'm, I'm hoping to open it up uh, to Q&A if any, any members of the audience who are live uh, wanna ask questions. Um, and then folks will post things later who are viewing this later and we'll, we'll send you an email, mm -hmm. Dr. Garcia. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm wondering, so one of the themes, we're teaching a class called Justice Boot Camp this mm -hmm. semester. And one of the themes of the class is lifelong activism and how you sustain um, activism, you know, what techniques and what self-care and what networking mm -hmm. and self-love and all of that that you use in order to sustain the lifelong struggle for whatever form of social justice you're pursuing. And I'm wondering, you know, how you've managed to do that, be a lifelong activist and what advice you might have for someone who's uh, at the early part of their life looking at a whole lifetime of gender justice or racial justice or environmental justice or intersectional, whatever justice they're pursuing, like what advice you would give them? Meditate. <laughs> um, wow, I think that saved me, right? I think whenever I have a question in my heart that I can't, I can't, um, that I can't figure out, or if there's some harm that I'm seeing that is just breaking my heart, or if there's some leadership that is just uh, spouting uh, some hate rhetoric that I just, that hurts my body, I just go meditate, you know, because um, it's on that cushion that I can always, I always end up back in three-year retreat when I sit on that cushion, you know, and I can find um, balance, you know, um, and I think it's all about balance. It's all, it's all finding like it's not separate from me and it doesn't make me feel bad. Like, like this, this, like I am this leader not like that. Like he's my fault. It's not that it's just that 
it's just the other end of the spectrum, right? It's just, so I'm like, okay, so where, where's the middle point? And how do I find that middle point? And how do I bring balance to the world that has become so divisive? You know, how, how, how can I bridge it? Um, because we're gonna end up just fighting each other and not moving forward otherwise, and that's not okay, right? So I think as a person, a lifelong activist, needs to understand that it's about balance. And sometimes you gotta pull towards another direction in order to reach that balance, of course, right? Um, and the, uh, I would say this, I would say, I would say it never ends. I, I, even though I was an activist, there was a part of me that believed that civil rights did its thing and that we had certain inalienable rights that were just there and that would always be there. And that's just not the case. That's what I found out. You can never rest on your laurels. You have to be out there. You have to be fighting for them. You have to be working for the people who can't work for themselves at the same time that you're building bridges. And you have to find a way for self-care because you'll, you will burn out. It's like being a caretaker for someone who's ill which I've also done. The caretaker almost needs as much care as the person who's ill. So you have to recognize that. You have to find if going off for a walk is your way to relax, go for a walk. If it's going to the gym, go to the gym. Find your thing. You have to find your thing because otherwise um, no one will be around to do the good work and we're all needed. We're all extraordinary, ordinary. We're all mighty and we're all needed. And um, don't ever think whatever little bit you do is, is not enough. It is. It is. We have not asked you about music, music and activism <laughs> and the role that music plays in your life. Yeah. Um, so tell us about that, Dr. Garcia. Yeah, yeah. I grew up around music, you know? My mom's a singer and, um, and a dancer. And so there was always singing, there was always dancing, there was always instruments. Um, I played instruments when I was young. I was not the singer. My mom and my sister are the singers, but I have a good ear so I could harmonize. <laughs> but there was always music. And I kind of put that aside. I put my artistic side aside to really follow the academic route. Um, even the writing took away all my artistic side. You know, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a, a complete stripping of that. And so here comes this, this wonderful man, Barrett Martin, who um, believes in raising people up. You know, he believes in raising people up and it's one of his most beautiful characteristics. And so he says to me one day, um, hmm, I, need, uh, I need someone to pay, play percussion for this gig we have. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, well, you want me to do it? Or you guys are all like, professional musicians you can't like bring some amateur on the on the stage come on and he's like you can do it you you danced you danced professionally you can do it if you're a dancer you can be a percussionist do it i'm like oh wow okay here we go um I, I don't have stage fright which is good <laughs> and, and i just got up there and i danced and i played and so i'd like to say i bring the shimmer to to all we do um, that's what percussion really is. And so every opportunity he's given me from, um, you know, being executive producer to uh, the recording of the Icaros and the Amazon with these amazing people. I just how it so happened, I, I speak Spanish and they speak Spanish and I was able to be that bridge between them and Barrett so that we could get the best product possible. Um, all the way to like Nando Hayes, uh, who he won the Grammy with, uh, calling and saying, "Hey, I have this anthem for for these times, for for what are you know, for protecting our Earth. Will you help produce it and and playing on that album, you know, and knowing that people it'll touch people in Brazil. I I I have a strong belief that that music. I mean, it's it, it sounds so trite when I say it. It heals." right? Like it, the reverberation of it transforms you if you're open to it. And so by, by being allowed into this world, by, by I don't know, it, 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 it has transformed me in a whole different way. 
right? Uh, to heal, to be on that stage in front of all those people before the pandemic um, and just see Barrett transforming people. I, I don't know if any of you have seen him uh, behind that drum set, he transforms. He literally like becomes a different type of being and, and, it, and it changes the bar into like a, a healing uh, <laughs> place and, and people are transformed by it. So I, it's such an honor. It's an honor to, to, to play music, to, um, to access, have access to, to that outlet. So, um, you know, I think art is a beautiful form of activism and this is just another aspect of that. You know, it reminds me of my, my brother used to work for this organization called Rock to Recovery, where they do, they bring music into, uh, you know, uh, folks who are suffering from eating disorders and post-traumatic stress uh, disorder from combat and addiction issues. And their, um, their motto is music is the medicine. So I yeah. hear that when you're talking about yes. healing. Yes. And I'm sure we all noticed that Dr. Garcia just slipped in. You're a professional dancer. You can do percussion. Can you tell us about your, tell us about that, that Lisette? <laughs> oh, that Lisette. Well, she was um, a grad student at the time. And I have a friend who was just, he was always inviting me to dance classes. And this really famous um, tango dancer was coming to Harvard. Um, and uh, he said, we, we need to go, you know? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I have no money. <laughs> and he says, come on, we just got to go even half a day. We just got to go. And so we go. And um, I just remember really clearly, I'm, I, we're standing in the room uh, waiting for him to come. And he, he walks in and the music cues, right? As he walks in and he's got beautiful, dark hair, dark skin. They called him La Pantera Negra, the Black Panther, right? And um, he like just walks in like a panther as the music is playing. And there was a stick in the corner of the room and he picks up the stick and he starts dancing. He starts dancing with the stick and I'm not even joking, like in front of my eyes, that stick becomes the most beautiful woman I'd have ever seen, so sexy. And something in, inside me just turned on and I was like, I can be his stick, <laughs> you know, I can be his stick. And so uh, we, start, we start learning the different steps and he starts using me to, to, to show the others, to demonstrate to the others what we're trying to do. And very quickly, we just found that we just fit. And... Um, after the break, uh, I started putting on my shoes and getting ready to leave. And he comes and he says, where are you going? I said, well, you know, that's it for me. That's, that's, all, I, that's all I was going to be here for. He's like, no, you have to stay. So he let me take the rest of the seminar and, um, and kept in touch. And then he reached out when his partner um, had suffered an injury. And he's like, I need a partner. And I said, well, I'm not professional, I'm a grad student, you know, and um, he says, you can do it, and, um, you know, there was a part of me that was nervous, but I, I thought back, and I'm like, I can be his stick, like, I can trust him to make me what he needs, and, and that was it, and it's the very same surrender you need in meditation, you push, you learn, you learn, and then you just got to back off, and let it, you just let it do its work, and it's, it's that where, that's where all the magic happens. It happens in music, it happens in meditation, and it happens in dance. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a question here. Well, first, there's an appropriate response, which is, wow, what an inspiration. This is from a member of our audience. It's an honor to hear this session. Two questions, if I may. This is from Fiona Ross. Um, firstly, for the women out there who don't see their potential and don't realize how amazing they are, how do we help them see? And then secondly, you know, I think you can see it if you click on the button. So um, as someone who obviously has a deep passion for help, uh, helping, supporting people, how do you cope with the it's never enough feelings, uh, well, yeah. right? So with all the problems in the world, as much as we do, uh, sometimes the problems can be overwhelming. How do you stay motivated and positive? Yeah. Thank you, Fiona. Beautiful question. You know, there's that 
Maya Angelou quote that says, you know, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. And I would take that a bit further and say, I'll just raise the 10,000, you know? Um, and I think that's what you do. You, it, you raise someone, you make someone just a little bit, little bit better. You, you um, help them shine. Like everybody has a gift. Everybody is good at something. And if you just, you know, whether you give them an opportunity or you um, interview them or you make them feel special somehow, um, you know, you can do it. Uh, it doesn't take much to make people feel special. You know, even just listening. People don't listen well enough anymore. You know, so just really being curious about people, asking them and just saying, wow, you do, you're a nurse and you stand on your feet and you help all these people all day long, every day. <laughs> That's amazing. Or whatever it is they do, you know, it, it, you pick up the trash, you make my world livable. You, you, you know, you, you clean the floors and you make the space perfect. Thank you. You know, thanking people, recognizing that anything they do is important. We're all essential, you know, and um, I used to say that, you know, I used to wonder, like, if I sat and I just like said, looked at myself and I said, have I done enough? I would probably say no. <laughs> you know, if I just asked that question, just like that, no, I could, I could be out on the streets doing more. I could be helping people more this way. I could be doing this. I could be doing that. And I think um, picking one thing and trying to be good at it, you know, is such a gift to the world, you know? And if you're kind and if you're honest, and if you're really earnest, <laughs> it changes things. It changes the space you're in. And um, I think that's why I meditate. So I find my balance again when I'm thrown off just a little bit. And, um, and then I just step forward again. Just focus on the part that's in front of you and then take the next step. Um, that's the best way not to be overwhelmed. I can't hear you. Yes. I, can't hear you. I was just saying that's beautiful. Um, oh, I've got you. people outside the window here, but um, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us and taking the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Here. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Such an honor. Um, and so we um, will make sure to, to send out some information about your, your book and um, the you. new organization thank um, you. you have going. And then um, this is the uh, penultimate uh, matrix uh, here uh, for the semester, but we hope to have you both back to talk about your musical work and other work that you're doing over time. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think everyone um, listening to this, you'll see it will be, it'll be online here shortly. Um, on Thursday, uh, Professor Rendon is here to talk about the Dreamers. Um, I saw that. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks so for this having will be her a on. There. It's a good way to close out. <laughs> so uh, we'll put all the links uh, if, when you're when you're watching this or listening to this. The links to uh, the music and uh, the World Migration Fund and all that will be in the description uh, of this podcast. Um, thank thank you, you so much, Dr. Garcia. Thank you both. Here. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody.